Hi, welcome back to the second part. So now I already taught you something about uh, sample-based testing, and now we want to look in more detail uh, how we can yeah, derive such samples. So, and here we're talking specifically about combinatory interaction testing, and what this is, I will explain in a minute. But first of all, small reminder. So when we want to test software product lines, um, we typically have uh, some um, problems aside from reliability. So problems that we also have in normal system testing, like uh, the source code is may maybe not available. Um, yeah, so for example, we have some components that are outsourced, or maybe we want to test obfuscated code from other parties, um, or even maybe we just want to choose that we ignore the code uh, for some reason. And um, of course, um, another problem is um, of statistical nature. So we don't actually know how um, errors are distributed in our source code. So this is normally not an equal distribution, but we don't know the actual distribution either. And so one reasonable approach that we could take is black box testing. So black box testing then means we just um, ignore the source code completely, even if it is known to us. Yeah, we just um, treat the whole system as a black box, which we can't look inside to. We just know, OK, we can put something in as an input um, value, and then we get some output or can observe some behavior of the system. And then from this, uh, we guess whether there is a bug inside our system or not. Yeah? When it, like I said before, when it um, adheres to uh, the uh, things that we expect, so everything matches, uh, like we expected, then there shouldn't be a bug inside. We can't be know for sure. But um, if we uh, see anything that's uh, different than the one uh, output that we expect, then obviously there's something wrong in our system, then we can investigate. So then there's a, um, now coming back to product lines, there's a, a big uh, um, a difference that we have to make clear. So I talked about this before, about test cases and uh, sample configurations. So the configurations that are in our sample, and these are not the same things. Yeah, so this is something that is often uh, also confused in literature. So this is why we uh, make this explicit here. So a test case is a specific um, um, execution of our program with input values that are fixed. So concrete input values and a concrete expected output yeah, that I can then observe uh, and compare to the actual output. And a sample configuration is just one configuration of the system where we can derive a product, which is then executed with lots of different test cases. So there are many test cases, uh, uh, test suite uh, most, uh, most of the time uh, for one sample configuration. And of course, when we need, um, uh, when we want to test software product lines, we need both. Yeah? So we need sample configurations when we want to do sample based testing. And for each um, sample configuration, we need test cases. And of course, there are, um, uh, can be uh, redundancies between these test cases then, but also these test cases are then uh, subject to the variability. So we, of course, can also configure our test case. And this, of course, uh, totally makes sense because these test variable code, so they should adapt to the code they are testing. But the actual um, derivation of the test cases, so how can we design a test case, uh, what are reasonable test cases for specific configurations, this is something that's out of scope here. We want to look at the whole system as a black box and focus on how can we derive these uh, sample configurations. Yeah, And of course, many ideas from the black box testing uh, approach also apply to, um, to um, the sample configurations. Because here we also totally ignore our implementation artifacts or the code that's inside it. And we just want to derive the sample configurations based on the features that we know of and the feature model. So the dependencies between the features. And from there, we want to derive uh, somehow our um, sample configurations. So, and one thing uh, what we can do, um, which um, solves or addresses at least the problem uh, that I told you about before uh, with the feature interactions is pairwise interaction testing. So what's the idea behind pairwise interaction testing? Here again, you can see all the 26 valid configurations from our example system uh, that I've shown you before. And now um, we want to look at the specific um, combinations of features. So here, this is the feature get and the feature put, both are selected. And we can mark all the configurations. Yeah, you can see all uh, the configurations that are marked here. Um, and these, of course, also. Um, all of these configurations contain both features. Yeah? So all of them contain get and all of, the, uh, all of them contain put. So, and if we now test any of these configurations, we can be sure that we also tested this interaction. Yeah? Of course, again, dependent on the test cases. And um, yeah, 
then of course we have the, the chance that this interaction is uh, tested yeah? when we um, only um, test one of these um, configurations. So this is the idea behind uh, pairwise interaction testing. So wouldn't it be nice if we have a sample, so a list of configurations, where all of these uh, pairwise interactions that we could think of are contained in at least one of these configurations. So you can think of any combinations of features that you like. And we know that in the sample, yeah, uh, when we um, generate this with um, pairwise interaction sampling, then we know that there is at least one configuration that contains this specific interaction yeah, for two features. And then, of course, we have a sample, and we do the same thing that we said we wanted to do with sample-based testing. So we test every configuration in our system with the um, specific test cases for these configurations. And then we can be sure that we at least looked at all the possible interactions, or the pairwise interactions. So yeah, um, what are advantages here? Of course, um, this is much more applicable to large product lines than testing all the configurations. And typically, um, these samples that you need are really small. I, I will just show you how small they are. Um, but for now, just say, OK, this is applicable even to really large product lines. And um, yeah, so of course, this has some redundancies because we're testing more configurations, not just one. But as it turns out, uh, many of these configurations tend to be really dissimilar because we want to cover lots of different combinations between features with um, as few configurations as possible. And so these configurations that end up in this sample turn out to be uh, less redundant than if we would just choose random configurations. And a nice thing on top is that what I already said, we have the guarantee that at least every pairwise interaction that we could think of in our product line is contained in this um, sample. And we have at least the chance to test everything. Yeah, And as I said, of course, this still requires uh, good test cases, which we won't go into, into, uh, into detail here in this um, lecture. Um, but of course, this is dependent. But at least we have a good uh, starting point, which are our sample configurations, which we can then test. So, But of course, it's still a question how to actually derive uh, these sample configurations. And we come to this uh, in a minute. So, But first of all, um, when we're talking about feature interactions, yeah, we have to actually uh, look at all the different combinations between two features when we want to have pairwise interaction. So when we consider two features, A and B, yeah, of course, there are four, uh, four different um, combinations that we could have. So we could select both features. Yeah? We could select only one of them. Yeah? Those are two cases. And we could also select just none of them. Yeah? And in total, this comes down to four different combinations. And we have to do this for each pairing of features. Yeah? And so the actual number is, is a bit higher than just the uh, simple um, yeah, combinations of um, features. We have actually these um, four for each pair. OK, and of course, this is um, something um, um, we can yet now do for a feature model. So yeah, this is the model for the um, um, configurations I showed you earlier. And now, of course, we can try to be, uh, be a bit more clever. So we don't have to combine everything with everything else. So but we can, um, first of all, um, exclude some features. For example, uh, when we do this for testing, we can exclude all the abstract features. Yeah. So in this example, this is uh, API and OS. Yeah. So these are abstract features, meaning they don't have any implementation artifact, and so they can't really interact on a code level with other features. So it doesn't make sense to include them in testing. So we just throw away these features for now. And what we can also throw away are um, core features or dead features. So for example, features that are uh, included in every configuration, you know from previous lectures, these are called core features. In this example, it's only one. It's only this config DB root feature, um, shortened here uh, with C. And uh, this is something we can ignore because yeah, it's always uh, contained in every configuration. So we don't have to pay attention to including these features. It's always the case. And we can't deselect it, so we also don't have to bother coming up with a configuration that deselects the features because there isn't any. And now yeah, that we have our uh, remaining features, we can start combining all these features uh, pairwise. So and then we end up with um, something like this. Yeah? So this is a list of all the possible interactions. And you notice that there are two missing at the bottom. Yeah? So um, here. Uh, there is something missing, and here is also something missing. And of course, these are interactions that are invalid. So, um, so this means, um, or what would be here at this position is selecting both Windows and Linux at the same time, which is not possible due to the alternative group here in our feature model. And of course, um, this is a mandatory feature here, so we have to select one of the features. So, uh, meaning that this here, where we 
deselect both features is also not possible. Yeah. So, and of course, we can then exclude these invalid feature combinations because they can't appear in any configuration, and so they can't uh, cause a failure. Of course, um, we don't have to test them. Yeah. And so, all the remaining interactions now we do have to test. Yeah. Or we have to uh, derive um, a sample which contains all of these interactions. And as it turns out, yeah, you already see the sample down here. So these six configurations are enough to cover all of these um, interactions um, shown above here. So, and how is this possible? So I will show you. When we look at the first configuration, we can see um, all of the marked uh, interactions um, uh, in, the, in the bottom, uh, in the top. Uh, these are all contained in this first configuration. And you see this is uh, quite, quite many configurations here yeah, because of the combinatorics there. And um, then we look at the second configuration. And in fact, I will, um, I will make this a bit larger that you can see it better. So when we look at the second configuration, uh, we can see all the remaining uh, interactions that are now covered by this configuration, which were not already covered by the first one. And then we can continue like this. So the third one yeah, is now also colored in. And the fourth one, yeah, which is now also colored in, and the fifth one, and the last one. And you see, just by considering these six configurations, yeah, every interaction, every pairwise interaction is contained in at least one of them. Yeah, of course, there may be some uh, redundancies in it. So um, for example, um, the combination C and G, yeah, like this combination here, um, this is contained in uh, the first configuration and also in the second configuration and also in the third one. And of course, this is redundant, but we don't. We only care about having this specific um, interaction uh, once. Yeah, and in fact, um, I just realized, okay, the C is a core feature, of course. Um, so that's quite often that this uh, appears, but we also have something like this T and L selected, yeah, which is twice uh, in, in two different configurations, but Again, so this doesn't matter. So we only care about having every interaction at least once in uh, one of these configurations. And this is something we achieved. Yeah. So by coloring them in uh, per configuration, you see that all of the valid interactions that we can consider are actually covered. So what we can do now is also we can generalize this concept, right? Now we've looked at all the pairs of features, but we can also look at maybe three features or four features or something like this. And this is what we call now T-wise interaction sampling, where the T is um, a placeholder for uh, the number of um, features uh, or the size of your tuple that you want to consider. So of course, you can also select this to one. Yeah, Then you're only looking at uh, single features. You could say they interact with themselves uh, if, if you want to say that like, like this. Um, but yeah, of course, uh, it's a generalization. And so it's also an option to select uh, t equals 1. And so there, we only care about a sample that uh, contains configurations where each feature is at least one time selected and one time deselected. And then um, uh, we have achieved this one-wise um, interaction coverage. Um, but of course, t equals 2, we just looked at this. And then we can go higher. Yeah, t equals 3 means we have to look at all the three uh, um, uh, combinations between three features. And of course, as you go higher, there are more different combinations that you can look at. So with three features, yeah, you can see this here on the right side. So with these three features, we actually have eight uh, possible interactions. Yeah, So only uh, um, selecting every uh, feature in this um, three tuple. So this would be the first one. Then selecting only, um, uh, deselecting only one feature, this would be these three. And then uh, selecting only one, which would be these three. And then deselecting every feature in it, which would be the last one. Yeah. So there are eight different combinations. And in fact, it's uh, two to the power of t. So when we look at t equals 4, we would have 16 combinations and then uh, 32 combinations for t equals four and, uh, 5 and so on. Yeah, so this is something to keep in mind. Uh, the larger we choose our T, the more coverage, of course, I have. So I can be more certain that there are um, less, um, or that I can detect more uh, failures. Yeah, when when it's interaction between five features or six features, or so on. Uh, but of course, the amount of interactions that I need to cover is larger, and this also means that I uh, need to derive a larger sample. Yeah, um, which um, um, means more testing effort. Yeah, so and this is something uh, of a trade-off that you have to do uh, when you select your uh, T for your T-WAS coverage. But I will also show you a diagram that somehow um, yeah, shows this trade-off in, in, uh, in a better way. So now the question is, um, 
how can I actually uh, come up with uh, such a sample for T-wise interaction coverage? Yeah, so um, something that uh, you can do is having an agree approach. So of course, um, finding the perfect sample is a really difficult problem. So this is something you can't really do in a polynomial time. So you have to be uh, either using a greedy approach or an evolutionary approach or something like this. So we will look at a greedy approach for now. And so this is really basic uh, uh, what we have written down here. So first of all, you can just choose any configuration you like. They will cover as many interactions as any other. So actually the first configuration that you choose doesn't matter. And then for the next step, you try to find the best configuration. So the one that covers the most interactions that are not already covered. Yeah? And then you just repeat this step until every interaction uh, you want to cover is actually covered by the configurations in your sample. So sounds really easy, of course, but it has, uh, has of course, a catch or two. Yeah? So challenges here. Of course, when I choose something randomly, it's not deterministic. And this is sometimes a property that we want to have. So deriving uh, um, yeah, the, the same sample for the same um, product line each, each time. Uh, but of course, when I choose it randomly, I don't have this, this luxury, yeah, this, this property. So this is something you can consider. Uh, one possible solution to this is uh, when we choosing the first configuration, uh, we could use something like the all yes configuration, which we already talked about in the first part. Yeah, we know uh, this covers a lot of code because many features are uh, contained in this configuration. And then, of course, we can take it from there and then generate other configurations. Yeah, but this just one small optimization. Actually, it doesn't really matter um, in terms of our black box approach where we don't consider the code. Yeah, but it's something to keep in mind. Then, of course, the, the second problem is uh, in this uh, yeah, mysterious second step. So finally, the next optimal configuration. And actually, if you want to find the optimal configuration, then uh, you would have to look at all the possible configurations. And we know that's simply not possible for larger product lines. So here we have to do something clever, uh, come up with a configuration that is good, yeah, but uh, we never can find the optimal one. And of course, a related problem is the whole approach here. This is a greedy, uh, um, greedy algorithm, which means that even if at every step we choose the best configuration, it's not guaranteed that we end up with the best sample in the end because we don't um, optimize the overall sample, but only the next configuration. So and it could be that um, if we're choosing a different configuration at, a, at the step two, that the overall sample uh, would be smaller in the end. Yeah, so this is of course our end goal with these algorithms. Most of the time we want to have a really small sample that still covers all the interactions. Yeah, so and most of the time a greedy strategy is fine, but of, it, it doesn't give us uh, doesn't give us the most uh, or the smallest sample possible. Yeah, this is something you could only achieve through completely exhaustive search, and uh, this is simply not possible for larger product lines. So one algorithm that uses this greedy approach is called ISPL. This is a widespread algorithm, and uh, what it does, it actually iterates through all the interactions. Um, so all the interactions, not all the configurations. Yeah, this is something you can do. Uh, you can combine all the features um, with yeah, any T you like, and then look at all the interactions. And um, yeah, it tries to be a bit more clever about this. So uh, some things it does is uh, like it identifies the core features and dead features, like I showed you before, and it doesn't combine these. Um, it looks for invalid and uh, already covered interactions. So you don't have to consider them uh, twice when you're uh, iterating over all interactions. Uh, and it also uses lots of parallelization wherever possible. And another thing um, that uh, ISPL does, which is uh, really clever, is it first um, constructs a sample for uh, t equals 1, then for t equals 2, then for t equals 3, up to the number that you actually desire. And this is a nice property of these um, t-wise interaction samples. Um, a, t, um, a t equals 1 sample is always a subset of a t equals 2 sample. So when you have a t equals uh, two sample, so a pairwise sample, then you can be sure that this also contains um, a, a one-wise sample. Yeah, because when you cover all the different uh, combinations between two features, you also covered all the single features. Yeah, and the same for uh, three-wise uh, interactions. So when you cover all three-wise interactions, you also additionally covered all two-wise interactions and all one-wise interactions. Yeah, so this is some nice property uh, when you increase your t. And you can use this in this algorithm uh, to speed up the entire process. OK, and now we can look at uh, a bit of the um, efficiency and the effectiveness of such algorithms. So here, ACPL. And for this, we uh, choose a really simple example. So imagine we have a product line with eight optional features. And 
Now we just look at um, the efficiency in terms of the number of configurations. So how small do we, uh, uh, can we create our sample yeah, with eight optional features? And what we can see here um, are two diagrams. Uh, one shows uh, on the x-axis the number of features, yeah, so uh, from zero to eight. And here on the y-axis, we can see the number of configurations, so the size of our sample in the end. And when you see, when you just um, look at all the valid configurations, yeah, then you see, okay, it, it increases exponentially. Yeah? So this is something that we already know. Yeah? When we have optional features, it's just two to the power of the number of features, uh, many valid configurations. But when you look at the sample size for um, the pairwise sample that we generate, yeah, you can see that even with eight features, we only need 10 configurations to cover all the pairwise interactions, which is really low compared to all the um, actual uh, valid configurations that are out there. And in fact, um, in general, this number tends to grow logarithmically instead of exponentially, which is a really nice uh, property that you can have. So and you can see this also um, on the right diagram. So again, we have the number of features on the x-axis and the number of configurations on the y-axis, so the sample size. And here uh, we compare the different values for t. Yeah? So we have uh, t equals 1 here, t equals 2, and t equals 3. And uh, of course, what you can see is uh, what I showed you earlier. The higher you have your uh, value for t, the more interactions you have to cover. And of course, the larger the samples uh, tend to be. So when you look at um, yeah, eight optional features, you can see that uh, the number of, yeah, actually the number of um, one-wise samples uh, is always the same. It's two because you can just have one configuration that selects all the features and deselects all the uh, uh, features uh, as a different configuration. This is possible when you only have optional features. It's not always possible with um, uh, yeah, regular product lines, which have some dependencies. Um, but here, of course, it's just a constant factor too. And uh, when you look at a pairwise sample, then you see, okay, we need 10 configurations. This number that we already had. Uh, but if you increase your t, then you see also this number uh, tends to uh, grow uh, quite a bit. Yeah. So uh, there we already need uh, 23 configurations, which is still less than uh, 256. Uh, yeah. But it's a lot more than just 10. And you know, uh, the more configurations you have. Uh, the larger your uh, testing effort would be. Okay, so this is one part of efficiency. So how many configurations do I actually have, um, which I then need to test? And there's of course another um, approach to it when it comes to efficiency, which is how many times it actually takes to um, create such a sample. Yeah, and so um, this is again, now with uh, real feature models, uh, we have here um, different feature models with different number of features arranged in such a way that they are, have an increasing number of features. And this time on the y-axis, you see the time that it took to create a sample with ICPL uh, in minutes. And you see for most feature models, yeah, so even for ones with uh, over 1,000 of features, this is not that much of time we need. Yeah? So we need four minutes, which of course you can't do this when you just uh, do a commit and want to know, OK, is there any uh, problem with the code I just uh, committed? Um, four minutes might still be too long to generate a sample, uh, but if you do this uh, once for your feature model, so you create a, a sample and then maybe run this overnight or something, then this is totally feasible to have a four minute delay for uh, creating a sample. And also the other thing, you only have to do this once unless your feature model changes. Yeah? You, of course, you can uh, reuse your uh, sample for just testing when you uh, just um, change something in a code, but not uh, dependencies between the features. So, but as you also see uh, for more complex feature models uh, like the Linux one, uh, this can of course take a, uh, quite a considerable amount of time. So here it's um, almost six hour, uh, almost ten hours, and yeah. So this is this may not be reasonable in some settings. Okay, and um, again for these feature models, we have the uh, number of configurations. Um, just for your interest, um, so you can see it's still for large product lines, reasonably small. So we have uh, 77 uh, configurations for pairwise sample for uh, the FreeBSD feature model, which has over 1,000 feature features. Um, and for Linux, uh, if we want to have a pairwise sample, we still uh, need 480, which is quite a, quite a number already. But 
as I already said, you can't even count the number of valid configurations there are. And now you have a concrete sample that you can test, even if it's almost 500 configurations. But um, then again, you can be sure when you test all these 480 configurations that every pairwise interaction is at least, uh, or can at least be covered by a test case, yeah? which is a really nice property. Okay, and another uh, remark on how high do I have to uh, choose my T? Um, so there's a nice uh, study uh, which looked at actual errors in, uh, inside some systems and looked at, okay, would I detect uh, this error when I um, looked at it with a one-wise sample, a pairwise sample, a three-wise sample, and so on. And so what they found is um, all of the errors that they looked at uh, could be covered with a, a six-wise sample. So you don't need to go higher in practice than six normally. Yeah? Um, so you can see here it's 100%. So, and it doesn't really make sense to go higher than um, T equals six, yeah? because there are, maybe there are some bugs that are um, uh, with, uh, that involve seven features or even more, but they are so rare in, in, uh, in the industry and in real product lines out there that it doesn't really, um, yeah, it doesn't really compare to the uh, testing effort that I have to put in with uh, T equals six. Yeah, but the other nice thing that you see is already for T equals two, so, when you look at um, these data points here, you can see that you really achieve a quite high number of um, actual found errors. So you are, of course, over 50%. Yeah? So you find uh, um, uh, many errors in the system. And in fact, you are almost at 70% even with the um, yeah, worst performing product line out there. And when you go a bit higher, so with T equals three, then you are already above 80% and so on and so on. So um, you don't uh, have to choose a really, really high T. Yeah? You can reasonably say with uh, T equals two, T equals three, that you can cover almost all of the uh, bugs that are inside the system. Yeah? So inside real world systems. So which is a really nice thing to know, right? So we don't have to choose uh, T equals 10 or something uh, like this. We can uh, use really small numbers like T equals two, T equals three, maybe T equals four and have a um, a sample that is still small, but has a high potential of um, covering uh, these bugs or finding these bugs. Okay, yeah, and of course the, the same thing holds. Um, the lower um, I can choose my T, the less testing effort I have, and the higher I choose my T, um, the more uh, uh, failure detection potential I have. Yeah, so this is again a trade-off that uh, must be uh, resolved by the developers of uh, each system individually. Okay, and then we actually um, finished uh, with the second part. So just a quick recap on uh, what we discussed. So I have given you a, qu a small recap on black box testing and the motivation behind it and how we can yeah, apply this now to software product lines, how we can generate uh, samples for simple based testing. Uh, we looked uh, specific at combinatorial interaction testing, so pairwise testing and the general form T-wise testing. And I um, just showed you some uh, numbers on efficiency and effectiveness of these testing strategies. So when you do, uh, when you do want to have a further reading, uh, I can recommend these two papers here. Uh, so one is from me, so I can really recommend this. Uh, the other one is about SPL, the algorithm I already talked about, which again is a really popular uh, TY sampling algorithm. Uh, you can have a look at the paper. And the other one is an alternative TY sampling algorithm, which is called YASA, which uh, has a, a slightly different uh, greedy approach. Okay, and then again, you have a small uh, practice that you can do uh, in the meantime when you're waiting for the, uh, or waiting to start the third part um, of the lecture. And um, here you can, um, again, recall the trade-off between efficiency and effectiveness um, of um, TY sampling and, yeah, just uh, think about uh, what would be a good trade-off um, when you um, have the chance of even being more efficient or being more effective. So what would you choose as a good value for T? Yeah. Okay, and that's all for part two. See you again in part three. <laughs>